Hello, everybody. This is Hedgepick, and I don't. Subtitles are working. Okay, yeah, we're using a new subtitle. So anyways, um, I'm testing it, and the TV is not muted. Hang on, let me handle that. Yeah, we need to find a new subtitle. Did that work? Yes, it did. Okay. It's muted now. So. Hello. <laughs> yes, I do have sharp knives. As a matter of fact, these are extremely sharp knives. Andrew makes sure of it, and I appreciate it greatly. So the original plan, well, first of all, I'll introduce myself to anyone who doesn't know what I am and what I'm doing and what my purpose is. What are you looking for? Big pig. Oh, over the edge. Oh, it's rude. It. It's coming in uh, I was taught to cook when I was 10 years old by my um, paternal grandmother, my father's mother. And mom was working full time, and dad had all these stories about what a lovely cook his mother is and, or was, uh, she's since passed. And um, I wanted to learn to cook the dishes that dad always talked about that he had when he was growing up, you know, family recipes. And we used to have a, a his parents, uh, his uncle and aunt used to have everybody come over to their house on holidays. And on those holidays, my aunt, my great aunt Mebs would, her name was a Mary Elizabeth Bessie, oddly enough. Anyway, uh, she would do all of the cooking from scratch. And she had an amazing kitchen, especially when you're talking about the 60s and 70s. She actually had dual ovens. She had a utility sink in her kitchen for all of the washing and cleaning of things. And she had huge amounts of counters. She actually had marble countertop for rolling and handling her pastries. She basically had a cook's kitchen. She never worked. But she was the daughter of a base commander, and she grew up in a very social environment. And, you know, putting on dinners for 20 or 30 people was nothing for her. And everything she cooked was from scratch. Everything, everything, all the breads, the rolls, the pastries, all of the meats, all of the side dishes, absolutely everything she made herself. If she has be having people come over for Christmas or Thanksgiving, she was cooking for a solid week. She'd have like the dinner rolls. She'd have like two choices there. She'd have six or seven side dishes, everybody's favorite. She would have a turkey as big as a small child. I've never seen turkeys this big before or since actually. And then she'd have five or six pies for dessert. And uh, I always wanted I always helped her in the kitchen. I can't, we'd come over and we'd come over early and mom would help her with setting the table and such. And I'd help getting a start on the entire utility sink full of dishes. And I loved doing it. It was weird. <laughs> but uh, I always wanted to know the recipe for this or that. How did she make it? And she always told me, that's a family recipe, dear. I'm going to hand them down to my daughter. And, well, maybe you can see where this is going. Aunt Mebs died suddenly and without warning. And she never passed down any of her recipes. And as far as we know, she never wrote them down. Um, so all of her recipes were lost, but one. She passed on one because my mom begged enough and it was for a relish side dish that she made. and. People are creatures of habit, and our memories are tied not only to sound and sight, but also to scent and taste. And one of the magics of food is that you will remember the scents of 
Christmas, you will remember the smell of, you know, the pot roast your mother made or your grandmother made or your significant other made. And smelling it again or tasting it will bring them back. Um, it will bring back the memories of the good times you had together, you know, times where you times where you came together to celebrate the good and times when you came together to comfort each other in the bad times. And yeah, it is kind of a gatekeeper thing. The food will bring back memories. And going on, you know, you will have friends that will, you know, say, wow, you know, that one recipe that you did, that uh, Greek chicken that you made or the Greek lamb, in my case, that Greek lamb thing that you did, that was so amazing. Oh, my God. Do you remember that that summer we had uh, we had that and then we we had everybody there and it was so nice. It was before grandma died and, you know, she wasn't really eating much back then, but she liked it so much that she ate and everybody was so pleased with that. And you remember things like you remember a good time with your grandmother. You remember a time with your brother and sister-in-law, in this case for me. And they remember a time when I came over and cooked for them. And that's kind of the magic of food. And if you don't write these recipes down, it's just a memory that slowly fades and is gone. But if you have something like a family cookbook, uh, those recipes can be handed down and remembered. It might not be, oh, that's Aunt Meb's recipe for people who never met her, but they will remember that Aunt Karen, my actual name is Karen, uh, which is part of why I get so mad when people talk about the Karen meme. Um, they'll remember when, you know, they came over to Aunt Karen's house and they they had a certain recipe that I tell them was from my great aunts and they'll just remember it as mine and what a fun time they had and the family that was there and the presents that they got and the decorations and so on. But the memory will pass down then. And if they have that recipe, they can pull from, you know, someday they may cook that for their significant other or just because they want to remember. And I, started compiling these recipes 25 years ago, 35 years, oh boy, 35 years ago, trying to recover Aunt Meb's recipes by searching uh, old cookbooks that I found at garage sales and uh, community cookbooks and church cookbooks. And then once the internet came on, there's heritage recipe sites where you can look up recipes that are hundreds of years old. And I have actually found some of our family recipes that are hundreds of years old, you know, well over a hundred. I've got recipes from the 1890s that are identical to the recipes my grandmother made. And that's pretty impressive. And so I've added those into a cookbook that I was writing. And while I've been, I didn't just sit still after my grandmother taught me to cook. I continued to learn. I got, I watched cooking shows. I watched uh, celebrity chefs. I took a few cooking courses. I actually wanted to become a chef, but a garlic allergy made it so I couldn't. They wouldn't accept me into culinary school. And I just continued to read cookbooks and anything that sounded intriguing, I'd try out. And I started creating my own recipes. And so I recorded those too. And I have written a cookbook. It's in editing right now. And it's called Cooking with Hedge Pigs, which is kind of why my name here is Cooking with Hedge Pigs. And it's all about the preservation of recipes and memories and in my cookbook I write about the memories those cookbook those those recipes evoke um, there's a recipe in there for uh, oyster stuffing that my sister-in-law's father always brought when he came over for Christmas and my first time being away from home 
as a young woman, I was actually, and I talk about home as being my parents' house, I actually moved across the state, and I didn't have a place to stay while I was on a contract, and my my oldest brother and sister-in-law let me sleep in their basement room, and I was thinking I was going to get to go home for Christmas as always and really looking forward to it, but then my job said, nope, we've got deadlines, you have to stay. You'll have the actual Christmas day off, but you'll have to come back and start working the day immediately after that. So there was no time for me to drive or fly across the state to get back. And so I was there with my oldest brother and sister-in-law where her, while her family just descended. She had both of her sisters there and their husbands and their children and her parents. And I was sitting there feeling kind of sorry for myself and sad and very, very homesick. And her father, military and police work kind of runs in the family. Her father was an Air Force base commander. And he had three daughters. And so he kind of recognized the signs in me. And I didn't know Roger at all. I met him at her wit at her wedding to my brother, you know, 20 years before that. But I didn't know him at all. I just knew him by sight. And he came and sat down, you know, in a chair near me and he started asking me how I was doing and what I was working on. And um, hey Nougat, welcome in. Uh Roger started talking to me about, you know, what were my traditions at home? What was it that my family usually did? And I started talking to him about it and he, about the food and, you know, what we usually ate. And he wanted to know if I'd ever had oyster stuffing. Did I like oysters? And yeah, I do. I like oysters, but I'd never actually had oyster stuffing because my mom hates oysters. And my dad's not crazy about him either. <laughs> so we never really had that. But he said, well, hey, why don't you try it? We've got the regular poultry stuffing here, too. But why don't you try the oyster stuffing? And I said, OK. And he kind of drew me out of my shell and talked to me about food and, and treated me like family. And he made it a little more bearable, made me feel like I belonged there. And he since passed. And my sister-in-law didn't even know he did this. But she read about it in the, the copy of the cookbook I gave her, where, as I put it, every time I have Waldorf salad, which is the other thing he brought over, or oyster stuffing, I think of how, <clears throat> I'm losing it here a little, um, I think about how this very kind man reached out to a very homesick young woman and made her feel at home. <laughs> and Andrew's got this look on his face and he's shaking his head because I always get gooey when I talk about it. But like I said, this is the power of food and memories combined. And that's kind of what I try to preserve here. Uh, Nuke it. Uh, you were eating oysters from the rocks on the beaches this week. <laughs> it's a ballsy thing to do. Uh, we have to watch out for red tides here, but generally you know when they happen because they warn everybody. Um, were they these raw oysters then, or were you take, plucking them up and cooking them first? I have eaten raw oysters. I like raw oysters. I like them cooked too. I like most seafood. I am not particularly fond of soul. You know what I yes, like? I, I know some people think of them as sea boogers, Kiwi. I like my wife not bitch crying. <laughs> so anyway, the plan for today was to cook uh, salmon in a sour cream dill sauce over fettuccine. Oh, yummy, that does sound good. Um, yeah, you have pristine water down there, and uh, it's summer, so very little rainfall to flush out the river muck. Yeah, 
That does sound good. I wish you could send me some. But uh, anyway, the plan had been to cook salmon, and it was because we found Andrew found salmon in the freezer when he cleaned the salmon out. Or freezer out. Thank you. You need to just leave it in the water, honey. Anyway, when we defrosted the salmon and I opened it up a little bit before stream, it didn't smell right. It was very, very strongly fishy and almost turning to ammoniac. And um, fish shouldn't really smell like much. If you have... I know what lipids and, and chitin are. It's little sea mice and stuff, and they, they are very tasty. Um, limpets are especially delicious. They're, they're a lot like a little clam almost, and uh, they're tasty. Fishy smelling fish is bad. Uh, fresh ocean fish should smell a little bit like seawater and just faintly of fish. Just faintly, not any kind of strong smell. It should smell more like seawater than anything else. And when it starts smelling strongly of fish, your fish is rotting. And once it actually hits the ammoniac stage where you can smell ammonia in the scent, the fish has rotted. And at that point, you're going to become very, very ill. At the point, actually, where it smells strongly, strongly fishy, I don't, I don't eat it. I don't want to run the risk of getting food poisoning. It's just not worth it. Uh, food poisoning is nothing to, to, to giggle about. It's more than just, oh, well, you know, my stomach is upset. I was vomiting or whatever. No, you can die from, from food poisoning. So, yeah, not worth the risk. I am now going to take a small drink here of my water. I am going to hydrate. So basically, there is an importance to having a plan B. And I didn't really have a good one. <laughs> I thought about just making uh, the pasta and putting some caviar in it, which I still have, which is uh, Tobico caviar. It's a uh, flying fish rope. And my husband hates it, would never even touch it or try it. He doesn't like the taste of anchovies. And this has the same kind of fishy saltiness that anchovies have. Um, not that he's going to try what I'm going to do here, but we did have the soy chicken, which is what this is. It's called a tender bit. Oh, you can't see it. Tender bit. And it comes canned in a broth that tastes remarkably like a uh, chicken. And if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you probably know about it. It's from uh, Loma Linda, and it's a, pro it's a product called Tender Bits. And I had a can of that, and I had some artichokes, and I decided to go ahead and adapt a different recipe to it because I'm not eating meat at the moment, and I would have to make another beef dish because that's all we've got in the freezer at this moment. I'm on a disability retirement at the end of the month, and I've said. So for uh, there is a trick to frying it correctly as being stinky. You can't dehydrate it before it goes full rancid. Yeah. Um, the problem is uh, nougat that my stomach is so sensitive that I don't dare even risk anything. Hey there, MPH. How are you doing? It's great to see you coming in. I'm glad the whole soy chicken thing hasn't put everybody off. <laughs> um, can we get a shout out for Nougat Honey? He is a Australian chef, and he is also a variety game streamer. 
Are you enjoying the uh, are you enjoying your uh, time off after selling your closing down your cafe MPH? I know I ran into you in the Grub Truckers uh, stream and you told me about that. And I am going to get started on cooking now. Um, so basically, uh, I came up with a second thought, and that was to use this um, vegetarian chicken product along with artichoke hearts in a sour cream and milk pan sauce and combine that with Italian herbs. And <laughs> I bet you are enjoying your semi-retirement. What a lot of people don't appreciate is how much work there is working in a kitchen. And it's even more than that if you own the kitchen. So I can definitely uh, identify with that. I am going to turn this... Um, electric skillet here on warm and I am going to start a stick of butter which is a half a cup of butter to melting and basically I'm going to cut it up into about a tablespoon pieces just so it melts faster um, and the I, I'm going to be kind of doing almost what you would if you were going to make a uh, fettuccine alfredo. I'm going to take butter and milk and add some sour cream to it, which is where it very varies from the recipe. And you cook that down a little bit in a pan, and then you add the cooked pasta with its pasta water, which has starch in it and you toss the pasta in it. Now with fettuccine alfredo, you would also add um, freshly grated Parmesan or Pecorino Romano, and or both, and combine that. And as it melts, it creates this lovely velvety sauce that the starch from the noodles turns into um, your cream sauce. And it doesn't use actual flour so it's not a white sauce although technically it kind of is so mostly in that it's white so i'm going to get those started and then because i don't want to have a huge amount of big bites these are fairly big i'm going to cut these into quarters and add them in these are fully cooked as you might expect and they don't contain garlic, which is a good thing since I'm allergic. And they just need to be heated up. So I'm going to go ahead and put them in there and make the sauce around them. And if you were, you could do this using, you know, chicken or turkey leftovers. You could use it with fish leftovers, or you could do it with chicken that you would saute first and then make your sauce afterwards. So there's a lot of different options on how you could adapt this recipe to your contents. Um, it would also work with uh, beef quite well. The beef and artichokes that I'm going to add to this uh, also pair very well with beef. So it's a very versatile vegetable that is uh, in the thistle family. And the artichoke heart that I have here, they're actually quartered artichokes and they're baby artichokes. So you could pretty much eat the whole thing. And as an adult, you would have to remove the choked hair at the middle of the heart. Hey, Tom. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, Tom, the salmon I was going to cook wasn't good when we when we thought it. So I had to uh, make an adaptation into a plan B. And because what we had was um, vegetarian chicken, I'm using vegetarian chicken. But like I said, you could use beef, you could use turkey, you could use actual chicken. 
um, you could make it completely vegetarian and use the artichoke hearts and uh, add in some spinach and maybe some snow peas, and that would taste pretty good in this too, uh, along with the artichoke. So you could also use tofu that you sauteed. Um, this is going to be a hedgy dish because it's vegetarian. This is not something I'm going to ask Andrew to sample uh, because he has no real interest in soy chicken. That's okay. He still has that huge amount, half of it at least, of the white. Dana's Kitchen. Hey, Dana. Welcome in. Let's give her a shout out as well. She is a home cook. And she cooks wonderful, inventive, creative food along with her uh, husband and their dogs. <laughs> and I am cooking. While you're at it, honey, give yourself a shout out because my husband has started streaming games and he is 10 signatures from affiliate. So if anybody could help him out, that would be so awesome. I would appreciate it greatly. Just a little follow. Take a look at him. He's he's funny. He's sarcastic. He's snippy. He's British. <laughs> and you can definitely hear that in his stream to all of those statements. He has got everything else but needs 10 more signatures. So appreciation would be great. You're unfollowing him, Kiwi. Sure you are. Anyway, what I am making here, when I found out that my salmon wasn't any good, I switched it to a vegetarian and actually vegan uh, soy chicken product. And so I am going to be cooking this along with some artichokes, and I'm going to make it into a sour cream sauce with uh, Italian seasonings in it. And I'm just going to cut these artichokes up a bit more so they spread throughout. And there's nothing wrong with the eating them whole. I do quite happily. And actually from this uh, canned or frozen artichokes, I make my own marinated artichokes since I'm allergic to garlic and can't have it. Uh, I use my own uh, artichokes and put my own seasonings in there and actually the seasonings that are going in this mirror that I am going to be using basil and parsley and oregano and it's not going to have onion in it. I've got a tide of water from the can that's flowing across my cutting board so I'm going to keep that from running into my lap. I have put on warm a um, stick of butter, which is half a cup of butter. And that is just basically heating through that uh, soy product called Tender Bits by um, Loma Linda. And it's a product uh, that is sold by the Seventh-day Adventists. You can also get it on Amazon. It's a little expensive, but it's vegan. It actually tastes like chicken, although the texture is more like a chicken uh, meatball. And it was kind of a surprise to me when I first came across it when I started becoming vegetarian uh, because my body doesn't like to process animal proteins. I've lost the enzymes to uh, digest it, so it makes me sick like food poisoning. And um, I know that some vegetarians lose the ability to digest meat because they've been vegetarian too long. Uh, I didn't start that way. I just gradually lost it. So uh, I was actually surprised when I first found this product that it tastes like chicken. <laughs> uh, the broth that this, these things are canned in tastes like chicken broth. It's not, but it does taste like it and it's lower in sodium it has no cholesterol and if you are watching for things like this i believe it does have gluten in it so but they do have gluten-free versions for those that are non-gluten and are gluten-free and it's a good alternative 
it, it lasts simply forever in the freezer, or pardon me, in the, if you've cooked it, it lasts pretty good in the freezer. It lasts really well on the shelf. And like I said, it's a good alternative, especially if you're going to have a vegetarian come in. Hey, cats and coat, welcome in. This is one of the people who does actually eat vegetarian. So I am making a alternative. This is my B item instead of what I was going to cook when my salmon uh, turned out to not be good. We had some uh, of these tender bits from um, Loma Linda, which is soy chicken, which is soy chicken. <laughs> it, uh, we had some of that in there, so I shifted my recipe over to that. And honey, you can take this away now if you would like to, because I don't need it here anymore. I am going to... Thank you, sweetheart. And now I will move everything else over. This is not going to be a very long stream because this doesn't take very long to make. Um, basically, we've got two pounds of fettuccine. Oh, I need a stirring thing too. I guess I'll just use this for now. Um, I need either a spoonchula or something like that, sweetheart. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, so to this, I'm going to add some pepper, probably about a quarter teaspoon, and I'm grind it myself. This has got a can of the tender bits in here, a 15 ounce can of the artichokes. As always, after stream, you can find it in my. You can find it in. Uh, my Discord under stream recipes. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. This is an already salted product, so I'm not gonna add a lot. Like I said, probably another quarter teaspoon. And that's uh, sea salt that I'm putting in there. And then, um, this isn't gonna use your usual cream sauce uh, ingredients in it. I am gonna put in basil, and that's about a teaspoon. Of basil and it's basically the Italian herbs that um, we get when I'm making the artichoke uh, marinated artichokes or mushrooms myself I'm helping yes you are you did leave the water in that yeah I left the water you want some water in it did you okay. yes. still got water in it. okay so I am going to put in about a teaspoon and a half of oregano. And I can already smell this lovely herby scent. Yeah, <laughs> liquor is helping. Trust me, he's not going to be licking this. Mm -mm. He stays away from the soy products. He, out of curiosity, when we were first married and I got some deep fried uh soy um tofu that i had a lovely um sweet and sour sauce for he tried one of those just to be curious and see what it was like and he liked the crunchy outside the mushy inside kind of put him off a bit and he hasn't tried it since so that was a tablespoon of parsley i added in there just to make this nice and green and to this now, I am going to add, as it's warm, and the herbs in the butter are starting to already scent the air. I am going to turn this up to about 225, so it's a fairly low heat. And I am going to add four cups of milk to it, and this is a 2% milk. You can add... Um, 4% if you'd like, or whole milk. I really wouldn't recommend going fat-free on it. Uh, let's see. And I'm going to add the equivalent of about a cup of um, sour cream, and that's full fat sour cream. And this is a 14 ounce container. 
I think I've used maybe two ounces of it. So that's about 12 ounces. So somewhere around a cup, three quarters of a cup is gonna add a nice creamy tanginess to this that will pair very well. If you use the actual chicken or beef in this instead of the soy product, it pairs very well with that too. Uh, I have actually made a version of this with chicken before and Andrew pronounced that very edible. He doesn't really like artichokes, but he thought it was definitely acceptable and he did help me eat the rest of it. So it was good enough that, that he was happy with it. Now, like I said, we've raised the heat on this a little and I need to melt the sour cream and get the milk to thin. Uh, it will thin the sour cream, the sour cream will thicken it. I'm gonna reduce this sauce a little bit. If you jump up here, daddy's gonna put you in your kennel. My dog is now sniffing around here uh, because he likes the smell of this. Um, you know, a dog wouldn't lie. It smells good. <laughs> He's also a weird dog that loves, loves um, lettuce, cucumbers. He's an Italian greyhound, and I have never found an Italian greyhound that doesn't love lettuce. As a matter of fact, the first one my husband knew very well was my dog Mako, the one that came before this. And she was sitting on his on his uh, chest. We were traveling across the state in a car, and we'd stopped at McDonald's where he'd gotten a Big Mac, and they sprinkle lettuce everywhere. And he'd saved the lettuce for uh, into a little pile, and he'd gotten a couple pieces of meat for his dog, his corgi, Meg. And he offered her the meat and she ate the meat and turned her nose up at the lettuce he offered her. My dog Mako turned up her nose at the meat and gobbled the lettuce. <laughs> She's Italian, she was watching her waist. But all of the Italian greyhounds that I know of all love vegetables. Um, carrots is not uncommon because dogs generally have a sweet tooth. But uh, the only vegetable that Meg liked was jalapenos, which is weird. And captioning system is working. That's good. Uh, Meg would lick. Um, Meg would lick the the my fingers after I had cut a uh, jalapeno. And yeah, she knew it was hot. She just liked it. Um, I've never had a dog react that way to anything before. Although I did know a horse, they have a product called Bitter Apple that you would spray on their stall doors and walls if they would uh, suck on them. Horses, if they're stuck in stalls, develop odd tendencies. One of them is they will lock their teeth on the side of the stall door and they'll suck wind and it can cause colic and they can die. And you discourage them from doing this, hopefully by getting them out of their stall and letting them run around in a pasture for large portions of the day. But you can also get this bitter apple spray and put it on there. And they had such high hopes for that, but the horse gave it a lick and then absolutely drooled. Streams of drool down his stall door because he liked it so much and would just stand there and suck on it. He liked the bitter apple taste. And I've tasted it out of curiosity. I don't detect any apple. All I detect is just jaw-clenching bitterness. <laughs> anyway, uh, Smudge likes cucumbers too. Um, pickles, no. He, even he doesn't like pickles. Uh, I don't, he doesn't like the uh, taste of uh, vinegar. Not unsurprising. Ow. That would be the hedge pig touching the side of the electric skillet with her wrist. Don't do that, it's hot.
I love pickles too, Kiwi. I really do. Andrew thinks they're disgusting. He doesn't like vinegar at all in anything. So, yeah, I like things like Italian dressing. I like vinaigrettes. I like, I like a lot of different things. Now, this has all come up to a nice steam. It hasn't really reduced any yet. I'm going to give it a bit more. And then I am going to start adding in the pasta noodles which haven't been drained and <laughs> I uh the pasta hasn't been drained and the starch that comes off the noodles that normally you rinse away is what's gonna thicken this sauce so Now, if you don't start by um, whisking the warm milk into your sour cream, generally your sour cream can look a little curdy at first. Um, it does relax and make a nice velvety sauce eventually, but generally not when you first made it. However, it all tastes good. It's not broken. It's not a, uh, it's not soured or anything. I'm gonna start adding the pasta in here with the good pasta fork. There's ones like this that bend really well. That's great if you're not using any kind of weighted pasta and fettuccine is heavy pasta. So, this will make it so it doesn't bend. Try not to throw the pasta all over everywhere, but it never quite works that way. This is two pounds of fettuccine. And yes, I know for some of my watchers who are not with us, but will always have this question. Yes, you can use gluten-free pasta. You can actually make this with um, either a vegetable noodle like, lasagna, uh, like um, zucchini or something like that. You can use those, but you will probably have to add a thickening agent like arrowroot or cornstarch. Um, because it won't have the starch to, you know, bring off the chemical process that is actually thickening this. This does not have a lot of water in it, so I'm just going to dump the whole thing in and turn that down because I don't really want the sauce to boil. And it's trying to. Like I said, you can see that the sour cream is kind of clumpy in here and once it really mixes in that will go away for instance the leftovers of this will be lovely and creamy but for appearances right now i probably should have tempered it a bit better by putting the hot into this into the sour cream and then whisking it rather than doing the reverse but this is more of a pan sauce and as you can see, when I stir in an area, it becomes nice and creamy. So it's just a matter of actually getting to it all and stirring it. I am going to add all of the pasta and what's left of the water into here. Normally, I would say what I would be adding is about a cup of water. But the pasta, like pasta does, has absorbed a lot of the water already. So... Here we go. And now I will run this through it. Get this stirred up. Now, Parmesan cheese will have this same look 
even as it's melting. If you use the stuff that comes pre-ground, um, and the reason why is they actually use an anti-clumping agent in it, and uh, that makes it so it doesn't quite melt properly into a sauce. So if you're going to be putting Parmesan, or for that matter, Romano cheese into one of your sauces, you probably want to grind it yourself if you care about whether or not it has a few clumpy looking things for a while. And as the fats incorporate, as the uh, sauces come together and are better stirred when they're reheated, when they have time to rest, these clumps of cheese or milk fats in this case will actually recombine. This is not something that's when they talk about a sauce breaking, this is not what they do because you really can't rescue a broken sauce. But this is just me being a little impatient with how fast I was making this. So I have got this coming together and it is coming together nicely. The pasta has to do its work with the uh, sauce and thicken it and finish rewarming as it was getting a little cool. And pastas also, um, they absorb the liquid that you put on it. So if you make a spaghetti sauce uh, with tomatoes and you put it on your pasta, you go and um, Put it in the refrigerator and you think oh yeah that's plenty saucy and then you go back the next day and your pasta looks dry and it kind of is dry it tastes good but it's kind of dry and it's not as good to eat it's because your pasta has absorbed the liquids and it has absorbed the water and what you need to do then is add some tomato sauce to it or some tomato juice uh i keep uh, cans of V8 that I use to cook with because I like the mix of vegetable taste instead of just plain tomato. It's a little zippier. It adds more depth of flavor. And I'll add that to tomato sauce um, if it's in pasta and has absorbed. So that's just what I do. And it reconstitutes it. I do it before you microwave it and then I microwave it. And the sauce is lovely and married together like you would think it would be uh, after spending 24 hours in the fridge or even 12. And it's a, an experience like the first that you would want to have. This is actually getting very close to being done. It doesn't take long for the starches to work on this. So I am going to actually turn the heat off under this because it doesn't need to boil. I don't want it to stick or burn to the bottom. And it has created the sauce beneath. There are some areas where it's still a little thin. Hi, Kate. Did you actually make the spaghetti from the other night, Kate? Or did you guys just have, uh, just, are you talking about just watching it? Did you try the recipe? sauces come together quite nicely. I am going to dish up and Andrew's going to take pictures. Grab some pieces of the chicken. Mm 
in some of the artichoke bits. paper towel out now and clean the edge of my dish so it's nice and pretty for the pictures. Go and let's gently put that under. And Andrew is now going to take that away and the sauce is a little saucier than I would normally serve it. It's a little bit looser but it's I'm also going to be putting this away I'll have to be adding some milk to it next time we reheat it because the sauce will have come together into a nice thick cream sauce and it will um, it will need some extra milk to help loosen it up and that's really all it's doing at that point. You can do it with milk, you can do it with uh, additional sour cream or you could do it with uh, cream, actually. I'm going to walk that out of the way and I'm going to try this for you now. And try a piece of the chicken first. You can taste the chickeny flavor of it. Like I said, it doesn't have the texture of a piece of chicken but it's more the texture of um, a chicken meatball. And there's some of the artichoke. And I'm going to try that with the pasta. And the pasta has uh, basil and oregano and parsley on it, some salt and pepper, sour cream, milk, and butter. That's the bite there. I'll hold it up for you. The pasta is al dente. It's tender, but it still slightly resists the, the, the bite. It, uh, the sauce, you can taste creamy in texture, although it doesn't look particularly creamy. It is creamy in texture. The sour cream adds that lovely sour cream tang to it. You can taste the chicken product. You can taste the artichoke in it, just a sort of a vegetal flavor. You can taste the basil and the oregano, which is kind of a surprise with this particular recipe. You would think, you know, maybe dill or something. You would think maybe cheese, but what you've got is a sour cream kind of Italian flavored sauce that goes with it. You made it. Awesome. I'm so happy that you guys liked the white spaghetti and that you tried it. Um, did you make seven quarts of it like I did? Because <laughs> that's how much I made. <laughs> two and a half pounds of hamburger, two pounds of pasta, lots of other things in there. It made a lot, just like this did. And um, this is something that you could try with seafood. You could try it with uh, beef, you could try it with actual chicken, or you can try it full on vegetarian, uh, add artichokes to it, some spinach, um, add some mushrooms and some, you know, blanched snow peas. That would make a very pretty, very tasty, full on vegetarian, veg vegetable only, no soy product, uh, pasta dish. And I encourage you guys to think about doing this one. There is the recipe for the one that's made with chicken, also in my stream recipes on my Discord. And I think we are going to raid uh, two feet at a time. 
She is a long, dark streamer and just a really sweet person. She is trying no Goa. No one gets out alive in the long, dark. And it's a wonderful thing. Oh, thank you for coming in, uh, Raging. It's lovely to see you. As you see, you're coming in just as I'm raiding out. Uh, please catch the VOD for this. I think you'd like it if you substituted in... Um, vegan uh, sour cream, vegan milk, and vegan butter in this, and some, uh, if you were to put in um, vegetable noodles instead of this, it is actually very delicious cats and coke. I know this is a short stream, but um, I planned it for salmon and <laughs> I planned it for salmon and it just didn't work out because my salmon wasn't any good. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for the follows that you've added in. Thank you for coming as always. And once again, please remember Andrew Gbantis is streaming now and we're trying to get him to affiliate. If you could give him a follow, I would greatly appreciate it. And I, I will put the recipe up. I will put the recipe up and no, it's never going to be deleted.